Hello, I'm Simon Linke. I'm a musicologist working at the Legity Center in Hamburg Harburg. And while my research mainly focuses on nonlinear dynamical systems, today's talk is about self-organizing maps. They may not be familiar to all of you, as they are often overlooked in today's discussion about artificial intelligence. Nevertheless, depending on the use case, they have great benefits compared to other AI algorithms. Here on the left, you can see such a self-organizing map. It is often described as a two-dimensional cut through the human brain. Each square represents a single neuron and the colored dots show where specific data is processed. As in human brain, similar tasks are usually processed in the same region of the brain. Colored dots close to each other on the map refer to similar data. But we will have an in-depth look at on how those maps work in a minute. When talking about music, we are usually biased by our musical experiences, education, and of course our personal taste. This may lead to fruitful discussions in our daily lives, but it is a serious problem when systematically analyzing music and its perception from a scientific point of view. AI may be a solution. If the algorithms are not trained, AI does not know anything about music. It's a little bit like the unbiased brain of a newborn baby. So, if the training data is chosen carefully, a neutral and objective view on the rather emotional topic of music can be provided. Most AI models we talk about nowadays, like for instance ChatGPT, are so-called connectionistic models. They process information using complex networks of artificial neurons, but while they lead to amazing results, we do not yet know why they make certain decisions and what yeah, what's influences them. So the approach of self-organizing maps is quite different. It illustrates how the neuronal field organizes itself during learning by placing similar stimuli close to each other, thus making learning transparent and allowing us to trace how the results are arrived. So one can judge the influence of each single data parameter. Thus self-organizing maps is very helpful in data processing, clustering and data classification. But later we will also discover a few examples how these algorithms can be used in a more creative way. So in this talk we first have a look at the in-depth mechanisms of self-organizing maps. We explore how they can be trained and how they can be applied to several types of data. Then I will share some thoughts about how music can be transformed into data suitable for training such a map before we have a look at several applications. And finally, there's a short conclusion of the topic. Self-organizing maps were introduced in the early 1980s by the Finnish researcher Toivo Kohon. That's why they are also called Kohon maps. These maps rely on unsupervised learning. Once the system is defined, it reorganizes itself without any further input, revealing complex patterns and structures. Each data that should be used to train such a map must be described as a series of single numbers, the so-called feature vector. This is a very complex problem when describing music as the features may be composed of many different values. Thus, a high dimensional feature vector must be used. A trained Cajon map provides a mapping from this high dimensional input layer to a two dimensional output layer, the so-called unit layer. Okay, it sounded very mathematically confusing and complicated. So let's have a closer look on a practical example to learn how this algorithm works in, in practice. So on a computer, colors are usually described by the amounts of red, green, and blue. Thus all colors construct a three-dimensional feature space and a three-dimensional vector of those space can describe each color precisely. Having this in mind, we can sort different colors using a self-organizing map. So let's have a look at an interactive example which explains how this precisely works. It's an online demo which is also linked in the text so you can try it out by yourself. This is also true for most of the other demos I'll show during this talk. So feel free to explore them by your own. Before we can start to train our self-organizing map, we have to find a suitable set of training data. So by moving the slider on the upper right I can, and pressing this button, I can uh, just select a number of colors and the colors I like best. Then I can start training. So this is the yet untrained Cajon map. Initially, each point of the map points to random location in this three-dimensional feature space. Or in other words, 
the color of each square is chosen randomly. To train the map, we identify the nodes whose pointers are most proximate to the location of each item inside the feature space. So to say it a little bit simpler, we're just looking for those squares which have the same color like the colors in our training data set. So this looks quite nice, but how do I have found these squares on the map which matches best to the colors in the training data sets? Therefore, we should look back into the feature space of these colors. For a better visualization, we focus just on two dimensions, red and blue. Each color has a specific location in this two-dimensional feature space, and we can determine how similar two colors are by calculating their distances. In mathematics, there are many ways to calculate those distances. One common way, which is also often a good choice when training self-organizing maps, are the so-called Euclidean norm. Here you just calculate the square difference between each parameter individually and calculate the square root. So when describing colors, we calculate the difference in red, green and blue each individually, then square it, sum it up and calculate the square root. Thus we can determine how similar different colors are. Once we found the so-called best matching unit for each training item, the map starts adapting to it. The item tracks the node's pointer towards the location of the item. This means we modify the pointer to become a weighted mean value of the item's location and the original pointer. The weighting is called the learning coefficient and it usually decreases over the learning period. Also the point of neighboring nodes are modified, but with increasing distance to a lesser amount. We can easily visualize this result. After the first training step, the color of the map cha has changed and the training items change their best matching units. This process is repeated many times. Finally, no changes can be detected anymore and the training is supposed to be over. As we train the map using colors, the pointers of each node can be visualized quite easily. But as soon as we choose different data and the dimension of the feature vector is bigger than three, we can't visualize it that easy anymore. Therefore, usually the so-called U matrix is calculated. You can see it on the screen. It looks rather complicated, but the approach is straightforward. Again, we calculate Euclidean distances, but this time instead between the distances between a node on the map and the training data, we calculate the mean distance between a node and all the neighboring nodes. And then we calculate the mean value of this. As you can see on the bottom left, here everything is yellow, though the neighboring nodes are quite similarly and thus the value is rather small. So we show it with a black region on the U matrix. But as soon as we move to another color, in these regions in between, neighboring nodes are quite different and so the distance between the neighboring nodes is rather high. Though these regions are represented by bright or white regions on the U matrix. Of course we lose a lot of detail but a compromise must be taken when trying to visualize the whole high dimensional feature space on a single two dimensional map. As the map is now fully trained, we can use it to uh, apply some data to it, which was not used during the training process. So I can just look for another color and I can pick a color I, I like. And the, now I can see where it is sorted on the self-organizing map. So I picked the blue and you can see it lies somewhere between green and brown because there's no blue region on the self-organizing map. But if I took a rather green color, you can see it is sorted into these green areas. As already told, calculating the U matrix causes a loss of detail. This may be a problem when analyzing the map in depth. 
So therefore, one usually calculates the so-called component planes. They just visualize how a certain feature distributes over the map. So here we can analyze the magnitude of the red, the green and the blue for each node individually. So here, for instance, we see regions where blue is quite present and a region where it isn't at all. Okay, I hope we now have all a rough idea how a Cajon map works. While finding a suitable parameter set is quite straightforward when using colors, it becomes much more complicated when transferring it to music. One solution might be to focusing on sheet music, where everything is written down. But as most of you already know, sheet music lacks many dimensions like sound and articulation and is usually limited to classical Western music. Other cultures don't use sheet music in, in that, that uh, way we do. Another solution might be to focus on raw digital waveforms like they are recorded by an audio interface. But these use huge amount of data, so many thousand values per second, and there's no direct musical meaning in those um, data streams. Well, the solution I usually prefer are psycho psychoacoustic parameters. They are directly linked to musical perception and usually you can describe the perception of the music using only a few of them. We can have a look at one example. Here you can see each frequency which occur in the sound which I am now making, so in my talking. This is again lots of data, but I can reduce it focusing on the spectral centroid. This is just the mean value of the, uh, of the frequencies which are occurring. So it is quite low when I'm speaking with a low voice, but as soon as I increase my pitch, it also increases. But this is not just one value of this whole complex spectrum. We can, could also um, increase the amount of detail by adding the spectral spread. This shows how much frequencies around the spectral centroid are present in a sound. So while, while, for example, whistling, the frequencies are very narrow. So it looks like this. But the spectral spreads get much wider as soon as noise is involved. And another psychoacoustic parameter which can be derived from this, um, yeah, from this spectral data is the spectral flux. It's just a rough representation of it. It just represents how the overall spectrum change over time. But there are lots of other parameters which can be used to describe music in a psychoacoustic way. For instance, the roughness of a sound. So if two frequencies sound at the same time, they may be quite different perceived. If the frequencies are relatively similar, we perceive a quite of beating, but as soon as they move farther away, the sound become rough. It sounds like this. But as soon as I further decrease these distances, the roughness decreases again. Yeah, we can we can perceive. A so now you've seen a few examples how those psychoacoustic parameters can be derived from measurements. And of course, depending on the on the system we want to uh, investigate, we have to choose carefully which parameters are appropriate to achieve. A, yeah, a sophisticated artificial intelligence model. As we now have learned how to derive psychoacoustic parameters from sound recording, we can use those parameters to train self-organizing maps. In the example here, we fuse parameters derived from the spectrum you already saw before, like the spectral spread or the spectral centroid, and train the map which can distinguish between different piano sounds, where we focus to distinguish especially between modern pianos, historical hammer pianos and historical harpsichords. On the map now you see the U matrix of this 
the U matrix of this self-organizing map. We can see in the middle there is a big black area. And as we learned before, items are similar if they are close to each other and if the background is dark because then neighboring nodes are quite similar. So we can look at these items and in this region these are usually historical hammer pianos. We can listen to the recordings. And beside differences in tuning, the overall sound is rather similar, especially when comparing it to a bright region over there. This is the sound of the historical harpsichord. Though even inside these light regions, sounds can be drastically different if, ne if neighboring notes are not similar either. We then talked about those component maps, which just describe how one specific feature distributes over the ma whole cohone map. Here we, for instance, can look at the sound pressure level, and we can see that in the region on the upper left, sound pressure level is much higher than on the lower left. So these recordings should be louder than the other ones, and this is what can we perceive when we listen to this modern piano over there. This sound is rather loud compared to the ones on the bottom of the screen. Another parameter which has a big influence on distinguishing between modern and historical pianos is the spectral flux, though the change in the spectrum. When striking a piano, the sound in the beginning usually is quite bright and while the sound is decaying, the sound becomes darker. This can be perceived when listening to the modern piano sound. And even though on historical pianos the sound changes also, it changes in a different way and this is how they can be distinguished. We can hear it when listening to the sound of a historical harpsichord. So by looking at those component planes, we can not only distinguish between different pianos, but we can also find out where the differences are coming from. So, in the second example, we can use self-organizing maps to analyze gamelan music. So gamelan music, which is originated in Indonesia, use different instruments than we do in Western music, which has completely different timbre in a so-called inharmonic overton spectrum. Further, they are also using different scales, so they don't use minor or major scales, they use their own scales. And in musicology, there has always been a discussion how those scales look exactly. We got a rough idea of how they are arranged, but at each individual orchestra uses slightly different tunings. It's impossible to find a an, an scale which is um, yeah, right for every orchestra, like we would find in Western classical music. So maybe the AI, AI is a tool which can help us to solve those problems. In this application, we can listen to a gamelan tune, and while the tune is playing, I can move the sliders and change the tuning of the instruments during playback in real time. So just let's listen to it.
the piece started using the slender scale, which was originally recorded for this piece. So during the recording, this scale was used. Then I messed around with the sliders and finally ended up using the common major scale, which is used in Western music. And if people listen to those uh, different tunings from this piece, they usually perceive the major scale as being not, not really uh, suitable for this music. It sounds a little bit childish, like playing a weird toy piano, while the original slanto scale sounds rather authentic. And this is an uh, opinion which also was given by people who are unfamiliar with uh, gamelan music and have their, uh, their roots in Western music and are used to those uh, major scales. So why is it like that? The reason is probably that if the overtone spectrum of those instruments is so inharmonic, the scale must somehow match the overtone spectrum. Although there is a distinct relation between tuning and overtone spectra, which will lead to this gamelan sound and which is perceived as be uh, yeah, well suitable. Though may the AI help us to find those, those relations. They are there perfectly reasonable as every gamelan orchestra usually uses its own instrument, so they slightly adapt the tuning to the instrument they use. And tuning in gamelan instruments also means changing the overtone spectra of the single instruments. And thus we can see if there's kind of a relationship which can be reproduced using the AI. All right, these are the resulting self-organizing maps when training the algorithm with gamelan music. On the right, we see a map where we put those dominant frequencies of the spectra and so get a rough expression of the overtone spectrum of a certain gamelan orchestra. We were looking if we can find a difference between Western and Asian gamelan orchestras. But in fact, we didn't. We can see the AI perfectly sorts every single ensemble, which is represented by a different color, in its own region. And you can see these are the dark regions, again, which are separated by stronger, lighter lines. So this is what I already introduced. Every gamelan orchestra uses a specific tuning and a specific spectra, but there are no systematic differences which are uh, connected to the origin of those orchestras. But there are some differences when looking at the other map. Here we can see the circles represent Western orchestras, from, usually from Germany, and the uh, squares represent Indonesian orchestras. The map was similar to the piano trained with data derived from the spectrum, with psychoacoustic data, like the spectral central, but this time we don't look at mean values, we look at how those parameters change over time. And when looking at the map, we see some differences between Asian and German orchestras. We can see here in the middle where most Asian orchestras lie. And if we look at the components map, for instance, from the spectral centroid, we can see that here there's quite a balanced performance where the uh, individual features change themselves, so this the spectral centroid, but in a somehow balanced way. While on the other hand, the German orchestras lie completely on the lower left or in the upper right corners. Here, some extreme changes in the uh, temporal parameter secure, and these must be originated in the changes in the dynamic. So they have, yeah, they have a strong expression, so they seem maybe to overperform. Or on the upper right, there's no dynamical changes or few dynamical changes which could be detected. But we can just listen to them and decide by our own. Just clicking on the point will play the music. This was a German orchestra from Hamburg, and now he is an Indonesian recording.
So when comparing both maps, we can see there are no systematic changes between German or Indonesian gamelan orchestras. They all have their own distinct spectrum, which is typical for a certain ensemble, no matter where it comes from, but there are differences in performance. So German musicians seems to perform in a different way than Indonesians do when playing gamelan music. As a third example, we can use self-organizing maps to analyze different types of electronic dance music. So producers or DJs in the field of electronic dance music usually use the term fatness to describe music. And if they talk to each other, they're quite sure what they mean when talking about fatness, but it's hard to explain it to people who are not part of this of these music scene. So if we want to use self-organizing maps to explain electronic dance music and to analyze electronic dance music, we have to paint a picture of this fatness because everyone is talking about that so this is an important feature which we should introduce in our algorithms. But as no one can explain it, in this research it was first investigated what do people mean when they talk about fatness. Though my colleague asked different people who are a producer of electronic music or are DJs, he played some different songs and they asked, okay, how would you judge the fatness of these songs? And if you can see on the chart on the right, the fatness is increasing over time. Though so on the left, you see some musical pieces from the 60s, which are, aren't perceived to be really fat. You can listen to one of those. Well, on the other hand, on the top right, these are more modern pieces, which sound, for instance, like this. I guess most of us would agree that the second musical piece was much fatter than the first one was. But the researcher first implemented an artificial intelligence model to see which musical parameters are connected with this perceived fatness. So it has to be something, the lower frequency must be quite prominent, but they must also change over time. While there's also a small region in the higher frequency, which must be prominent. And though he took different relevant factors, and now he can calculate the overall fatness of the sound. And then in a, in a second artificial intelligence model, we can use this calculated fatness together with other psychoacoustic features like the spectral flux or the loudness of the sound to calculate uh, an artificial intelligence model which distinguish between different genres of electronic dance music. And you can see on the left there are different colors referred to different genres of electronic dance music. And uh, you can see they grew relatively good by the colors. Of course, there are small exceptions. For instance, this red dot over here is surrounded by the blue ones. And usually these are pieces of music which were a little bit ahead of the time, which introduced new genres. And that's why they're already at the border to another musical genre. Um, we now can have a, have a look at the different features and we can also look at the perceived fatness and we see okay, the pieces on the lower left of the map are perceived much fatter than those on the upper right. Again, we can listen to those. And now one which should be perceived to be more fat. <laughs> Yeah, this is an interesting example and it might be helpful, for instance, when, uh, when you want to uh, somehow organize your personal music library and connect similar songs of similar genres uh, to, to one group and then you create another playlist with, with different songs of a different genre. But it's also a helpful tool, for instance, for DJs. So if you want to create an interesting set which will last for, for one night. You, If you connect points which are close to each other on the map, they sound quite similar and there you can design your own transitions. If someone comes to the DJ booth and, and asks for a different song, maybe maybe this yellow one over, over here. Uh, 
But you're currently playing this this violet one on the left. So maybe it is a little bit too different. And though if you just switch the songs, people will leave the dance floor. And therefore, you then can find a pass along the map to go from this point to another one. And every step is not that far away. So that the transitions are quite similar and you can fulfill the wishes of the audience without interrupting the musical flow too much. Okay, these were three practical examples where we used the uh, SOM to analyze music. Now let's uh, go a little bit back to see can we use SOM to represent musical syntax or syntax in, in, in any different way. And therefore we start with sorting different words. So for this uh, experiment, I just took every word of the um, introduction of the paper by Kohonen, which was published in the 90s. And though I took every word and said, okay, this is an input item for my self-organizing map. And how do we describe words? We already had described music, we had described colors. How can we describe words? I said each word is a vector which has 26 dimensions. And each of these 26 values represents one letter of the alphabet. And then we just count how often does this le letter appear in this word. And then we write this number down. And this is a an, an way of representing words. But of course, it didn't take into account the order of appearance of the letters. So how does it look like when, when we feed this into a self-organizing map? So you can see it. Um, the, the red dots represent several words. I took just 50 words out of this paper randomly and we can see somehow organized, but it's not really clear what, what, is, the, um, yeah, what is the purpose of this. So the has stand next to tones because they both have an S at the ending, but, but it's not very helpful. So maybe our approach was a little bit too naive and we better change it. So the idea of calculating those Euclidean distances between different items must not work when compared to letters and thus also might be problematic when dealing, for example, with sheet music. So we just change the uh, metric which we use to distinguish if certain items are similar. And therefore we choose the humming norm or humming distance. This is an, a different way of calculating distances it sounds rather mathematic, but in fact, it is rather simple. So we just have two words. One, one is tooth and the other one is tough. As you can see, they look quite similar, but they got two different letters. And these are the letters U, where by tooth is an O, and G, where tooth is a T. And though when calculating the Hamming distances, we just say we count the overall number of letters and we count the number of letters which are different. And then we count, we divide the number of difference letters by the length of the word. So this time we're going to word that five letters, two are different. So we divide two by five. And though the distance between these two words, the humming distance of those two words is 0 0.4. And we can use now this way of calculating distances to train a map with distinguish between different words. And the resulting map looks like this. Now each point again represents a word and words which are close to each other look a little bit more similar like before. But what you further see is I've changed the color of the dots and the color now represents the length of the word. Though so this map perfectly sorts words according to their length. So the short words are on the upper right while on the lower left they are the long words. This is, yeah, this is of course amazing because we didn't tell the algorithm anything about the length of the words and it starts sorting them by length just by the way these, um, these, uh, uh, these humming distance uh, works. But it is not that helpful because for sorting words by its length, we don't need any artificial intelligence. We can easily do it by our own. Though we should further tend this approach. And the, in the next step, I just said, okay, if we, if it doesn't work when sorting, sorting one word, we just combine one word with its preceding word and with the following word. So we get, always get three words, which we took as the input 
for our uh, for training the self organizing map and so the the feature space depends not only on the letters of the word but only but also on the context the words are appearing and we can look at the results and now we can see they somehow cluster it's not sorted anymore depending on the length of the words and we got some regions where certain words are sorted so down here there was large letters strongest extremum so they seem to be connected based on their appearance in the paper um, and not anymore on the the length of the word or on the number of letters which are occurring now well, this seems to be a better choice when trying to sort words but how does it help us because we are talking about music so i guess the transition from musical syntax to syntax at all is not that far and letters which are organized in, in, in regular crits may be somehow compared to, um, to sheet music. Though maybe this is an approach which we can use and transfer it back to music. And now we can, instead of sorting single words, we can sort musical motifs. This, why is it interesting? I guess this is a Cajon map I trained distinguishing between different emojis. And you can see on the upper right, there's one emoji, which is somehow, yeah, got big eyes and, and looks a bit weird. And on the lower left, there's the emoji with, with wear sunglasses. Here's a laughing one. Um, and these are the, the best matching units. Here have we, uh, here's our training data adapted to. But in between those regions, there are somehow mixtures of those emojis. So here's one which is laughing, but had his eyes closed. And here's one which is somehow frighten i guess so we can find some interesting new faces in between the ones we have trained with and so if we apply this to sheet music or to musical motifs we may find some in between spaces in music and we can find some new motifs or like in electronic dance music we can alter one motif to another but just by slight changes by well, moving from one um, one node of the uh, self-organizing map to another of course, we have many degrees of freedom how we arrange it. Did we stick to the humming distance, then it's always changes of single notes. If we stayed to the Euclidean distances, then it might also be microtonal changes between one note and another, which we can apply while training those um, self-organizing maps and which will hopefully lead to new creative possibilities. Okay, as a last example, I like to turn the things a little bit uh, upside down. So we discussed about the problem of the uh, so-called U matrix that we want to somehow visualize this high dimensional feature space and we are not able to do this properly except for the example with the colors I gave in the beginning. So here's the idea, can we use music to make it more accessible? So we don't use the AI anymore to say anything about music or to produce music now we use music or sound in general to explore those uh, self-organizing maps and we just show some psychoacoustic parameters again which are as different as they could be so that they can be clearly distinguished from uh, listeners in this example one is uh, the, the chroma though the kind of a pitch which sounds always quite similar but changes its, its fundamental frequency <laughs> Then we change the roughness, this uh, parameter I also explained at the beginning, the while um, yeah, increasing this value it gets rougher. It gets rougher. And then we take the sharpness, so just the prominence of higher frequencies. And as a last parameter, we add a loudness fluctuation. And we now apply those four parameters to different features we have used to train the song. So this is the song it was about techno music and about yeah, more production-driven features of, of techno music. 
And we can see, okay, there are some black regions, so these points are rather similar, and these are true, but how are the differences between those points? And if I click on the map, I hear how the, the sound is resulting while mapping each feature to the uh, four psychoacoustic parameters I just introduced. And while moving my mouse around the map, the sound changes. And now I can perceive that these green regions are rather similar. While it drastically change when moving to these violent dots. And of course it further changed when moving to these uh, blue dots on the top. Again, we can have a look at the different um, component maps, but it's not necessary anymore. Now we can just explore the whole feature space just using our ears instead of our eyes. In the beginning, you've heard that you can clearly distinguish those four parameters, but when changing them all at once, it might become a little bit hard to do this, so you had to practice it. And therefore, you can just um, apply this 1D button and look at a component map and just hear the changes which were produced by this single component. You can hear as the tempo of the techno track increases the beating of the produced sound also that. Here we got a four dimensional feature space but we can also easily extend it. So this is an example where we got a seven dimensional feature space, which looks much more complex. I further added a modulation matrix. So here you can decide which psychoacoustic parameters should influence which feature of the Cajon map. Because in the, the example I just gave, the BPM was linked to loudness fluctuation, which is rather intuitive. In this example, it is linked to the color of a noise signal. Though, if you want to have it again, like before, you can easily switch it using this modulation matrix. And then if you're used to it, you can explore high dimensional feature spaces while looking at the U matrix and get an impression what's going on when, uh, yeah, when, when investigating a self-organizing map without having to switch uh, between every single of those seven component planes. Okay, so this is just an, a rough idea. The focus was that these different sounds are as different as they could be, so that they are easy to distinguish. On the other hand, they may sound rather annoying when uh, when applying this this uh, application, yeah, for for a longer time. Though maybe there's also the solution to map it to more pleasing parameters, even though they are harder to distinguish. Okay, now we have have a look at different examples on how Cajon maps can be used, connected to music, to produce music, to explain music, to analyze music. Uh, we saw they are a great tool, which gained deeper insight and really problematic musicologist questions. Um, but they also had to be handled with care as training data had to be chosen very carefully. Uh, I've got many examples. I just clicked them by myself and you could watch me fiddling around with this. Most of them are linked in the text, so please feel free to explore them by your own. Usually it's much more intuitive if you get an expression how those Cajon maps react, how are the differences between different different um, features on the Cajon map. And you can always be skeptical. So I mean, when I explore them, I always ask myself, the, the artificial intelligence tells me there's a different. Do I perceive it the same way? And if I don't, why? And if the if she told me that if there is a different, I can say, okay, I can't hear it, but maybe I can skip to these different component planes and then I got a new perspective even on already known music, which is always quite surprising and, and always a good moment. Um, 
we also saw that artificial intelligence can support artists by organizing the, the samples like we did on for the piano sounds or organizing music pieces like we saw for the electronic dance music. But we also somehow triggered the creative p potential when we somehow misuse these uh, Cajon maps, which we started already when, when trying to sort words. Of course, there is still a potential and this is not an easy thing, though therefore you have to understand the mathematics quite well that you can start to manipulate them. Yeah, and as a final example, we also learned that even though artificial intelligence is a great tool for analyzing music or describing music, the other way around is also true. Though we need music and sound to get deeper understanding of the results of artificial intelligence and maybe also of the algorithms. But as I already said, this is only my perspective on music and self-organizing map, which I gain from exploring those, um, those interactive online experiences. But they are linked in the text. Please try it yourself, build your own opinion about it, if it's a useful tool or if it's something you would not rely on and rather stick to your own creative mind. I guess it's always good to have a, a different point of view and those tools can provide it to you. So have fun.